in that luminous being who has rejected the Creator Himself, who has breathed out the Vedas, the repository of spiritual wisdom, and who illumines the hearts of all beings. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Om Peace, Peace, Peace be unto us all. So friends, I'm so happy to see so many of you here, so many of you taking advantage of this wonderful opportunity we have with Swami Sarva Priya Mandati, who's an old friend of mine, someone I'm delighted to welcome here again to Houston, who's been here before, but delighted to bring him back. One of our Swamis whom I knew long back, the head of one of our centers, he was known for his extremely long introductions to uh, guest Swamis. <laughs> Once his introduction was so long that the Swami he was introducing fell asleep on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it actually happened. We had to go, Maharaj, Maharaj, Maharaj. We tapped him on the shoulder. He woke up and came. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give a long introduction, and I don't need to give a long introduction because the Swami is well known through his YouTube talks, um, especially. Now, I'll just tell one story about that, which some of you heard me tell on Sunday, but many of you were not here on Monday. I was living in India. In fact, we used to uh, have coffee together every morning uh, in India at Belarmat, and sometimes we would meet in the evening at the university for coffee again. Um, and so while I was living in India, he came to America for the first time to visit. Uh, in fact, he was invited by the Houston Center that time. That was his uh, main reason for his visit. Uh, and I also had to come back to the States to get uh, my visa for India extended. And so we just both happened to be in Southern California at the same time. So one day I took him out to see sites around our Trabuco Canyon Monastery in Orange County. And when we came back, we were walking towards our room uh, when someone called from behind Swamiji, Swamiji. And since I had lived there for a number of years, I figured it was for me. So I turned around and said, yes, said, not you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had never seen him before, but he said, haven't I seen you on YouTube? And I said, yes. <laughs> so he doesn't need a long introduction. I'll just say that thank you one more thing, and that is that he is presently the head of the Vedanta Society of New York in Manhattan the oldest center of the Ramakrishna mission, older than Vedramat itself. The oldest center of the mission without exception, including in India. Uh, and so it's our delight to have him here with us tonight, tomorrow night, and Thursday. So I will ask him to speak. <laughs> Good evening. I offer my pronouns to Rivet Swami Atma Rupananda Ji. And as he was saying, we share a lot of wonderful memories of being uh, in Belur Mat for quite a few years actually. I thank him for giving me this opportunity to visit uh, Houston again. I can see quite a few known faces and lots of uh, new faces. Um, friends, this evening the topic is you know, in New York, they say you only one topic. <laughs> if I have a funny story about that, uh, I remember I was, I was touring Australia and New Zealand several years ago, or oh, five, five years ago, with Swami Banisharanandaji and Swami Kajanandaji, giving talks in different places. And after a couple of two or three talks, Swami Banisharanandaji was very humorous. He said, Next time, I shall ask to speak first. And then I shall say, you are Brahman. 
And then Salvatore Allen has got nothing more to say because that's the only thing he said. <laughs> he had got only one subject. So we have two talks today and tomorrow, but they are, of course, on the same subject of Advaita, non duality. Today's talk is from duality to non duality. And tomorrow's talk, I think, is called The Essence of All Vedanta. Um, Swami Vivekananda, when he would say as his mission in life, he said, is to, is to teach everyone, to preach unto humanity their own inner divinity and how to make it manifest in life. Basically, he said, I teach only two things. One is the divinity within us, and two, the oneness of all existence. It sounds slightly paradoxical. Two, the oneness of all existence. Anyway, so the divine oneness of all existence. This is the most beautiful way to put Advaita, non-duality. It is the divinity within us, by realizing which we realize the oneness of all existence. Adi Shankaracharya, in his introduction to the Mandukya Upanishad, Mandukya Karika Bhashya, he says, Yatha Rogartasya Roga Nivritta just as a sick person, just the curing of the disease is equivalent to regaining health. Being healthy is curing the disease. Similarly, our disease here is difference, bheda, duality. When we realize the, the non-dual nature of reality, then we get moksha, we get cured of the disease of samsara. So he says, Advaita bhava eva prayojana. The need, the requirement, what we need in life and spirituality is basically attaining the realization of non duality. The realization of non duality. Advaita bhava eva prayojana. Now, this realization of non duality, the, the I mean, it's a radical claim. Look at, look at our experience of the world. It's our experience is one of plurality, of duality, of, of multiplicity. And Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta has the nerve to claim that there is non-duality right now, right here. Not something to be attained elsewhere. You see, in Advaita, the journey is not from one place to another. Not that you have to go to some heaven somewhere else. And then only you, you attain spiritual realization. No, the realization of non-duality is possible here. It is possible now. It's not a journey through time. But now we are in duality. Many people misunderstand. Now we are in duality. And after we become enlightened, then there will be non-duality. Even that is not correct. There is actually non-duality right now, right here. Not only right now and right here, but we are that non-dual truth, which Advaita Vedanta speaks about, you. You are that non-dual truth. And that seems a very radical thing because uh, we see multiplicity everywhere. And how can it be that right here, right now, I am that Advaita, that non-dual truth. And yet this is what Advaita Vedanta claims. Then our big question will be, if I am that truth, why don't I know it? Why don't I perceive it? So Advaita says, the journey is not from this place to another place. It's not a journey through time, from now to then. No. You go to heaven, you are spiritual. After death, you will, you know, after something, a post-mortem spirituality. No. It is right now, right here. Then the journey is not in space, from here to there. The journey is not in time, from now to then. But the journey is from ignorance to knowledge. We don't know it. We don't feel it. We don't see it. How do you know it that I am this non-dual truth? How do you feel it? How do you see it? That is the journey. From ignorance to knowledge. From ajnana to jnana. What is required is knowledge. Is knowledge of our own non-dual nature. So we have about 45 to 40 minutes to complete this journey <laughs> from duality to non-duality. So the, the, the point I want to make here is the journey from duality to non-duality is one of knowledge. And being knowledge is an advantage. If it was a journey in space, then you would have to go somewhere. If it was a journey in time, you would have to wait until that time. 
But because it's a journey from ignorance to knowledge, just get that knowledge and you're free. I mean, it's easier. It's not as easy as that. But anyway, it's it's not anything more than that either. So we have about 40 to 45 minutes in which we, we should try to come to that point of uh, realization of our own non-dual nature. And I'm trying to do a little bit of Q&A also uh, at, the, at the end of the talk. I haven't started yet. <laughs> Here we go. For those of you who are interested, what I'll say today, uh, it's basically the same truth in every non-dual text, in every Advaita text, but I especially use a text called Aparokshanabhuti, which we were studying recently in um, New York, um, written by Adi Shankaracharya about 1400 years ago. It's a small but very powerful introduction to non-duality. The place to start is with ourselves, with the question, what am I? Who am I? What am I? Start there. Because uh, this non-dual reality which uh, Shankara talks about, which Advaita Vedanta or Vivekananda Advaita Vedanta talks about, is our own nature. And the problem is we do not know what we are. In fact, the even bigger problem is we think we know what we are. If you ask, who am I? Well, like I can tell you, I'm Swami Sarvapriyananda and then I have all sorts of documents to back it up. Uh, but Advaita insists that we are mistaken. So the ball is in the court of Advaita, in the court of Vivekananda and Shankara and others to show that we are mistaken. I think I am this person. Show me, how am I wrong? Who am I or what am I is uh, actually one of the fundamental questions in philosophy. Recently, uh, there was this meeting in Manhattan. It was a very intellectually alive place. So I saw this philosophy cafe. And the, I was attracted by the title, The Five Great Unsolved Questions of Philosophy. If you Google it, you'll find it. It's by, by Oxford University Press. They have um, set out five great unsolved questions in philosophy. If you're interested, what are the questions? The first question is, um, is uh, do we have free will? The second question is, what can we know? The question of knowledge and skepticism. The third question is, who am I? This is what we are going to talk about today. And just for the record, the fourth one is what is death? Not in the physiological sense, which is interesting for a doctor, but as a person, as a conscious person, what is death to me? And the last one is what is justice? So these are the five questions which philosophers in the Western world have decided these are the five most important questions in philosophy. And that was the discussion. They had two hours to solve these five, five great questions in philosophy. Very interesting discussion. And one of the questions was, who am I? We think we know what we are, and that's what gets us into trouble. Mark Twain, bless his heart, he said, it is not what we do not know that gets us into trouble. It's what we know for certain that it just ain't so. That's what gets us into trouble. <laughs> By the way, I don't know how many of you know, Mark Twain actually visited India. And he met one of the great non-dualist teachers at that time, Swami Bhaskarananda Saraswati in Banaras, whom uh, Swami Vivekananda also met. And Mark Twain, with his gentle humor, but very funny, he meets the Swami, and then the Swami's title is told to him, you know, 1003, 333, and so on. And then Paramahansa, Paripraja, Acharya, Bhaskarananda Saraswati. Mark Twain was flabbergasted. He said, he has a name bigger than most German words I know. <laughs> <laughs> and the Swami presented him with his own translation uh, of the Upanishads, his own uh, new commentary on the Upanishads in Sanskrit, uh, for non-dual realization. And Mark Twain very humorously he writes that I presented him with uh, the adventures of Arunbari <laughs> Finn. I presented him with that and he writes, it might not help him to get non-dual realization, but it won't do him any, any harm either. <laughs> <laughs> so, he presented him with that. Still haven't started. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take the plunge. The question is, who am I? Our first reaction is, when you are, when you are asked this question, it's very simple, here. Are you pointing to the body? 
Are we the body? Well, let's start there. Good place to start. You think we are the body. In Advaita, several arguments are given to show that you cannot be the body. I'll share five of them with you very quickly. What you do with these arguments is, first, understand what is being said here, intellectually. That's how you use these arguments. First, get it. What, what are they trying to say? Why am I not the body? I'll give you five arguments, five reasons. But more than that, they're powerful spiritual pointers. Once you've got what they're trying to say, then sit with that argument. Just bask in the light of that understanding. It helps. It helps to loosen this terrible mixing up we have done between ourselves, the non dual self, and this body-mind complex. If you sit with the arguments, it loosens the bonds. In fact, one of the meanings of the word Upanishad, Shankaracharya is, is bhashyas, when he explains the meaning of the word Upanishad, one of the meanings he gives is loosening the bonds of samsara. Destroying ignorance, making you realize that you are Brahman, these are the meanings of Upanishad. But also, one meaning is loosening the bonds of samsara. If you sit with these arguments quietly in a moment of reflection, when you begin to see that it is true, I am actually not this body. So what are these arguments? Many are there, but this is called Viveka. Atma, Anatma, Viveka. The distinction between the self, you, and what is not the self. <clears throat> see, what you know to be not the self, the clock is not me, the table is not me. You need not distinguish yourself from that. I know, I know I am not the table, I am not the clock. But this body, the problem starts with this body. Sometimes we say, I, here, sitting. Clearly I'm in the body, but I say, I am sitting here. Sometimes I say, my body, making a distinction between the body and myself. So with the body, the problem starts. We identify ourselves with the body, we behave as if we were the body, we speak as if we were the body, and yet there's an ambiguity about it. So that's where Advaita makes a beginning. Am I really this body? First argument, I'm going to give you five. The body changes. Traditionally, um, in Indian philosophy, we talk about six-fold changes of the body. What are these six-fold changes? The body is born, and the body comes in, being born comes into existence. It's a strange way of thinking about it, but that's also seen as a change. It did not exist as a separate body earlier. Now it exists as a separate body, so that's a change. First it's born, being born it comes into existence, and then it grows, develops, from a baby to a, a, a little boy or girl, to a teenager, to a young person, it develops. Reaches maturity, that's the, that's the fourth change, a kind of plateau. Forty. I'm sorry, but forty. <laughs> a, a, a doctor told me, a doctor told me that Swami, this is not what we tell people, but after 40, it's all the way down. <laughs> if you live healthy, if you are uh, exercise and eat healthy, you can manage the decline, but decline it is. Um, another doctor told me, nowadays with modern medicine, we can ensure that you live long, but we cannot ensure that you will live well. So the next stage, fifth stage is decline, aging decay, disease. And the last is, of course, death. So six-fold changes in classic, uh, this is a uh, classic trope in uh, Indian philosophy. Jayate is born. Asti comes into existence. Vardhate develops, grows. Viparinamate matures. Hits a pleasure. I remember I was not seeing too well. I went to a doctor. And the doctor said, oh, there's something wrong with you. I said, what? You've hit 40. <laughs> <laughs> you need glasses. <laughs> That's what's terribly wrong with you. So he said, as you go past 40, he said, one of the indicators is between 40 and 50 is that uh, you, your eyesight begins to uh, change. Then um, apakshiyati begins to degenerate and decay and fall apart. And then nashyati, death. Destroyed. The body, body is destroyed. Six-fold changes. And 
I feel, I feel that I was that little baby, I was that little boy and that teenager and that young man. I am this middle-aged person now. Very soon I shall be an old person, and very soon I will, I will uh, die. This is, this is, I am this person. These are the changes in the body. And yet I feel I am the same. The body is changing so much, six, four changes. But it is I who was the child. I was the young person. Then how can this I, same I, same I, how can it be this, this radically changing body? How can the changeless and the changing be the same thing? You see the point? A simple point, but it's very good to sit with this idea. Deep inside the idea is that the first I am the change, unchanging person. If you say no, I have changed, you will note that whatever you call a change in yourself is either a change in the body or in the mind, in the personality, in your ideas, in your beliefs, in your character. But in you, I was the person with those beliefs. Now I am a person with these beliefs. I was a person who was ignorant of some certain things. Now I'm a person who knows such, uh, such things. But I say, I was the ignorant one. I am the knowledgeable one. I was the one who felt that way. I am the one who feels this way. I is common. The unchanging I and the changing body, how can it be the same thing? In Sanskrit, nirvikara savikara. Our sense of a nirvikara, unchanging, Self and a clearly changing body, how can it be the same? First point. Think about it, stay with it. It's, it's very useful actually. There is a song, not that it's directly relevant, but it's, it's also very funny. Um, there's a song, you know, in, in uh, this requires some context. In Belurmat, when, uh, when the Swami passed away, we had permission from the local municipality to do our own cremation there. So there the Swami, the, 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 the person who was passed away is cremated by us. And it's actually a beautiful ceremony where we sing bhajans and meditate all night long. And there are some certain, certain songs, devotional songs, which are sung on such occasions. One of the songs is, um, Death, what fear do you hold for me? Marun ki bhai And there was this very senior Swami, who was himself passed away since Ramesh Maharaj, who was the person who used to sing uh, these songs. And others joined in chorus. Now, the lines in that song are like this. I was a child. Now I'm a young person. Very soon I'll be old, and then the body will pass away. And then once again I'll be born in some other form. So what fear does death have for me? And then it goes on to say that I do not need to be born again and again. Um, that means I am I, I rest in the lap of Shiva, who is of the nature of consciousness. And that's a very analytic song actually. Now the story is like this: when this Swami was singing, some kind of uh, somebody's funeral was going on, and this Swami was singing, and we were all sitting around, and this. Um, Swami is, was of a very devotional nature, so he decided to modify the song, because the song is a little non-dualistic. So the line goes, when he's singing, why do I need uh, uh, another birth? Because I lie in the lack of consciousness itself, Shiva of the nature of consciousness. I, I will not go to other births also. I am of the nature of immortal consciousness. Jnana. Jnana means knowledge. And then he added, why do I need jnana? I need bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> and Swami, um, um, Shiva Maharaj was sitting next to him, very serious Swami. And he caught it immediately and he said, hey, Ramashta, keep on saying. Hey, Swami, my brother, what are you singing? <laughs> Back to the original script. <laughs> he sang, Kanski Amar Gyan Bichari. What's the need for all that uh, you know, philosophical analysis and jnana? Let me, let me have bhakti. Back, back to jnana. So, nirvikara, savikara, how can the two be the same? Let's go 
another second argument. The body is an object of perception and you are the perceiver. Everything that you perceive is different from you the perceiver. A simple thing like this bottle. You can see the bottle. You can all see the bottle. You can see the bottle only because this bottle is different from your eyes. Your eyes are separate and the bot bottle is separate. In fact, the only thing that the eyes cannot perceive are the eyes themselves. Is that not true? We think that the limit of the range of our vision is out there. Very far away you cannot see it. But actually that's not true. Very far away also you can see. You get a powerful enough telescope and you can see the stars themselves. Very small and you cannot think, or you cannot see it, we think like that. But that's not true. You get an electronic microscope, you can see viruses also. Right? But the only thing that the eyes cannot see uh, are the eyes themselves. Some of you are puzzled, I know what's going on in your mind. I can see my eyes in the mirror. Yes, you can see a reflection of your eyes in the mirror. You can see a reflection of your eyes in the mirror. You can see a picture of your eyes in a selfie. But you can, the eyes cannot directly see themselves the way they see objects. In, so the seer and the seen are different entities. The experiencer and the experience, the subject and the object are different entities. They always have to be. Now when you apply that rule to, your, to the body, you come to a remarkable uh, discovery. The body is an object. I can see it. You can hear it. If your stomach is rumbling, you can hear it. You can touch it, and if it's very hot and sweaty in Houston, you can even smell it, unfortunately. So, <laughs> you can, every sense organ can objectify this body. This body is an object which you can experience. So the seer and the seeing are different. You are the experience, so the body is experienced. So it's whatever you are, the body must be different from me. I must be something different from the body. Because the body is an object of experience. In Sanskrit, drashta drishya. Drishya, that which is experienced. Not literally seen only, heard, touched, but any kind of experience. An object of experience is different from the experiencer. Drashta and drishya. How can it be said? I am the drashta, body is drishya. How can the two be said? Stay with this for some time. You will begin to see. You know, once I talked with a scientist, a neuroscientist, and we had this conversation, she wanted to know about Vedanta. She was not a believer in any kind of religion. Uh, she said, she was from England. She said, I'm a, an Ang Anglican by birth, but a non-practicing Anglican. But tell me about Vedanta. When I explained these things uh, to her, very sharp, she said, Swami, I, 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 I don't, I'm not convinced by what you said. But I can find no fault in arguments. <laughs> the, the logic is foolproof. <laughs> Seer and seeing, drashta and drishya, they cannot be the same thing. So the body clearly is an object of experience. How can I be the body? I am the subject. I am the knower. I am the seer. Experiencer. Body is known, experienced, seen. Drashta and drishya. Second. Third. This is even more subtle. Remember what we are trying to show, that you are not the body. I am not the, the body is there. We are not denying that the body is there. We are experiencing the body. But that I am not the body. The, the idea of the self that we have is that we are conscious selves. We are always conscious. We are sentient. We are aware. Consciousness, sentience, awareness is on my side. I am that consciousness. But the body is not conscious. You might say, no, the body seems conscious. It's conscious because you are there. It's your consciousness which the body borrows. What, what do I mean by the body not being conscious? The Sanskrit words are very precise here. Chit jara. Jara. Jara means insentient, not aware. Chit means consciousness. You are aware. The body is not something that is aware. If this is sounds a little difficult to understand, it's very easily demonstrated. Greg Good, who is a, a psychologist, a very interested, he's, he's very good at Vedanta. Uh, he lives in Manhattan, and we had a correspondence some time back, a little short correspondence, but in one of his books, 
he mentions this nice experiment, simple experiment. He says, look at your hand. When you look at your hand, if you do it now, you will have an interesting experience. You look at your hand, note the quality of the experience. Do you feel that I am looking at the hand, or the hand is looking at me? That would be very strange, you know, like a science fiction horror movie, the hand is looking hello there. <laughs> you are looking at the hand. You say, obviously, so what? Do it for the other hand. Okay, I'm looking at this hand. In fact, for whatever part of the body you do, you will get the feeling, I am looking at it. It is not looking at me. If each part of the body is something that you look at, and it is not, if you are aware of it, it is not aware of you, whatever you are, then the whole body, which is basically composed of these parts, it is not aware of you, you are aware of it. You are conscious, and the body is not conscious. This is closely related to the second argument, seer and seeing, drashta vishya. This argument in Sanskrit is called chit jara, sentient, insentient. Again, if you stay with this, you will see it's a very elegant, simple, but remarkably powerful pointer. It shows you you cannot be the body. Clearly, the massive difference between you and the body. Chit jara. How can the sentient and the insentient be the same thing? Then the fourth argument. Um, this is uh, actually very simple. In fact, too simple sometimes. The, uh, in Sanskrit, it is called eka reka. Eka reka means one many. Now, you always regard yourself, I regard myself as one being. We always regard ourselves as, as a unit, an identity, as one, one being. We don't regard, you don't think you are a committee, right? Says, no, I am composed of many parts. But the body is composed of many parts. Clearly, the body is a collection of many parts. Aneka. It is, it is a, a, a composite, complex machine, biological machine. But I always regard myself as one. So, eka aneka, how can one and the many be the same thing? How can a simple one identical unit be also complex and many, many facetious? It cannot be. It's a very psychological argument. You always, whatever, even people who have multiple personality disorder, they're usually one person at a time. They're not all persons at the same time. <laughs> so, you know, when we regard ourselves, whatever we are, we regard ourselves as one being, one thing, one something, but not as many. So whatever is many is an object of our awareness. This body is composed of many, an ekam, and we are one, ekam. There are a number of other arguments. The fifth one, let's just go with this. Nirguna Sagun. With attributes, with qualities, and without attributes of knowledge. <laughs> Whatever you see as an attribute, tall or heavy or uh, Indian or, uh, or uh, uh, Asian or American, whatever you see, male or female, whatever qualities, they all pertain to the body. You do not have attributes. So what do you mean? Look at, think about it. Every attribute about yourself which you apply to yourself. It either belongs to the body or to the mind. There is a logical reason why the self, in itself, is attributeless. Why? Because if you consider, if I consider I have such and such attribute, if I consider <coughs> that, then the question will be, am I aware of that attribute or not? Without being aware of it, how can I speak about it? If I am aware of it, then it's an object, it's not the, not the subject. It's something that I know, Some, not something that, that is the knower. I am tall. My attribute is I am tall. Body. I am a happy person. Mind. Personality. But you, the self, what attribute can you, can you give to the self? Somebody would say, Swami, I am aware. Awareness is an attribute. Advaita would say, awareness is not an attribute of the self. It is the self itself. So, anyway. Nirvika, Nirguna Sarvuna. Nirguna Sakuna. We have got five arguments so far. Let's go with these five. First, Nirvikara Savikara, unchanging and changing. How can the unchanging self be the changing body? And how do you know the self is unchanging? 
Look at the, any kind of change that you experience. They are all in the body and mind. And you never experience, if you experience a change, it must be something that is out, uh, other than the self. So, changing and unchanging, nirvikara sadhikara, how can the changing body be the unchanging self? The second, second one is um, drashta and drishya, experiencer and experienced. How can you, the experiencer, the seer, be the seen? The body is clearly seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched. And how can I be the, ex the experience? How can the two be the same? Seer and the seeing, drashta, drishya, cannot be the same. So I cannot be the body. Third, chit jara. Clearly I am aware of the body and the body is not aware of me. I am chit, sentient, aware. Body is jara, insentient, not aware. At least not aware of me. Well, the fourth one, um, ekam, anekam. I always think of myself unshakably so, as one unit, and the body as many, as a composite of many things. How can the many and the one, the simple and the complex, be the same thing? It cannot be the same thing. Nirguna Saguna, with attributes and without attributes, the body has many attributes. In fact, whatever attributes I think about as myself, you, I clearly find upon investigation, they belong to the body or the mind. So I cannot be the body, because of these five reasons. Logically, and also psychologically, if you think about it, you'll clearly see, yes, each of these five applies to me, and the body is, um, is a changing, is an object, is insentient, is a complex unit, uh, is, has attributes, and I am unchanging, I am the seer, I am, I am consciousness, uh, I am one, and I am without attributes. The two cannot be the same. What applies to the body applies equally well to the mind also. You see, most of us do not think, really we do not think we are bodies. We think we are persons. I am the person in this body. In fact, we have a sense, when we look at ourselves, our general sense is not quite that I am a body, but rather I am an embodied person. I am somebody here. That's our most, uh, uh, usually for educated, sensitive, grown up people, we do not consider ourselves to be just flesh and blood. We consider ourselves to be persons, thinking, feeling, desiring, understanding, loving, hating, a personality, likes and dislikes, personal history, my own biodata, all of this, this person in a body, attached to a body, maybe embodied. So this person, this is in very generally, let's call this the mind. So am I the mind? And this is where most people stop. Most people today, educated, sensitive, they would think of themselves as mind. Am I the mind? You will find, to your amazement, all those five arguments apply to the mind also. Think about it, changing and unchanging. Does the mind change? You say, oh boy, does it change? <laughs> From the morning till now, how many times the mind has changed? How many times happy? How many times annoyed? How many times irritated? How many times curious? How many times have you been bored? How many times anxious? How many times relaxed? How many times did you remember something? How many times you felt I can't remember? So all of this, the mind is changing continuously. Somebody said we have 16,000 thoughts in a day. Not distinct thoughts, not original thoughts, then you would be a genius. But it's <laughs> mostly repetitive, mostly mechanical. But Changes, enormous stream of thoughts coming and going. So the mind changes. And I am the unchanging experiencer of a changing mind. I am unchanging, the mind is changing. I am the seer and the mind is seen. Can you see the mind? Can you experience seeing? It's not in these eyes. But yes, there's a word in English, introspect. When I look inside, if I'm happy, I'm aware that I'm happy. If I'm unhappy, I'm aware that I'm unhappy. If I understand, I have the feeling, yes, I get it. If I don't understand, I have the feeling, I'm, I'm not very clear, I'm, this is puzzling for me. So these are, this is the mind and I'm aware of it. The movements of the mind, they call vritti, movements of the mind, like waves in the surface of a lake. I'm aware of it. So drashta drishya, I am the one who's aware of the mind. 
When the one who is aware and that which you are aware of, they cannot be the same thing. They must be different. And drashta mind is drishya. Normally we don't think that way. But we are aware of the mind and the mind is something separate from you. You are not the mind. Third, even more stunning, you are conscious and the mind is not conscious. You might say this is really objectionable because if anything we consider to be conscious, we consider the mind to be conscious. What kind of silly philosophy is this? That you say mind is not conscious. But it's all it's obvious when you take a look at it. It's so simple. I can demonstrate to you right now that you, the mind is not conscious and you are conscious. How? Think of thought. Nothing is coming to mind. <coughs> 2 plus 2, 4. Okay, think that. 2 plus 2, 4. Okay, are you thinking that? Yes. Are you aware of 2 plus 2, 4 or is 2 plus 2, 4 aware of you? <laughs> you are aware of 2 plus 2, 4. 2 plus 2, 4 in the mind. Yes, I'm aware of it. Is that thought aware of you? No. That is a thought in the mind, right? You might say these are words in my mind. Okay, they are words in your mind. Are those words 2 plus 2 is equal to 4? These words, are they aware of you, the, the, the being there? No, no, absolutely not. You are aware of these, these uh, words. So these words in the mind, these thoughts in the mind, these movements in the mind, or in the yogic language, chitta vritti, you are aware of it. You shining these words are revealed. In your life, these words shine. The words of the Upanishad, the beautiful poetry of the Upanishad, tameva bhantam anuhati sarvam. That shining, everything else shines afterwards. Tasya bhasa sarvam nidam vibhati. By its light, everything here is revealed. Everything here shines by its light. It means your light, you shining, you that person, shining, all thoughts in your mind shining. By your light, even your light is not correct. You the light, by you the light, everything, all thoughts in the mind are revealed. Very interesting, just a little while ago, I don't know how many noticed, we were singing the Arati, and the, towards the end of the Arati, there is a line, Jyoti Ra Jyoti, Ujala Riti Gandhara, light of lights shining in our heart. You are singing to God, and Advaita is saying, you are the light of light. Same, it's sacrilegious. God is you. That's what Advaita is trying to say. You are that reality, actually, when you know yourself. Consciousness, you are chit, and even mind is jada. Ekam anekam, very easy to understand. You always see yourself as one reality, whatever you are. Is the mind composed of many, many parts? Yes. The emotions and the memories and the desires, the many, all subtle, the intellect and the ego, all of them, mana, buddhi, chitta, ahankara, at least four, in Vedanta you make it fourfold division, antakkaran, the inner instrument. Yes, fourfold. One and many, ekam, anekam. And the last one, nirguna, saguna. Mind has many characteristics, happy mind, sad mind, I don't know, I, this song I heard, there's a teenager in, 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 uh, in uh, Denver. And I'd gone there, and the host family, they had, uh, the cousins were visiting, the two teenage daughters, and they were singing a song. It went something like this. I've never heard this song already. It seems to be popular among kids. Happy Lama, sad Lama, mentally disturbed Lama. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of it? Has anybody ever heard of this song? It must be a teenage thing. <laughs> I found it so hilariously funny. <laughs> so I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm mentally disturbed. All of this is the mind. These are characteristics of the mind. Happy mind, sad mind, and hopefully not mentally disturbed mind. <laughs> all of these minds, peaceful mind, meditative mind, disturbed mind, agitated mind, calm mind, sleepy mind, alert mind, all of these, desirous mind, all of these are characteristics of the mind, guna, saguna. Not you, you are this guna, you are beyond attributes. So apply these five, you will see, you cannot be the mind also. Sadhikara or nirdhikara? Changing, unchanging? No. Drishya and drashta, seer and, uh, seeing and the seer, 
Jana and Chit, insentient and sentient. Anekam and Ekam, many complex and one simple. Saguna, Nirguna, with attributes, without attributes. How can you be the mind? You cannot be the mind. It's obvious. It's in front of us. We are not the mind either. So you are that consciousness which is neither body nor mind. There itself, in that body. That body appears to you the consciousness. That mind appears to you the consciousness. So, <coughs> Swami, you're trying to slip in the word consciousness by sleight of hand. You smuggle it in. How do you know that I'm conscious? Well, you are aware, are you not? One thing that you are, you are not, undoubtedly, you are aware. The famous um, story about Descartes, great French philosopher, mathematician, who said, I am, uh, um, no, he set out to doubt whatever he could doubt. And then finally found that he could not doubt his own existence because I, I think, therefore I am. Some people interpret that as that Descartes stopped with the mind, but actually he stopped with the Conscious self, which is conscious of the functioning of the mind. He could not doubt that. I think, therefore, I am the famous cogito ergo sum. Yes. I saw this cartoon in which uh, <laughs> Descartes is sitting in a Parisian cafe and he's saying, he's having coffee. And the waitress comes and says, Monsieur Descartes, um, another cup of coffee, more coffee? And Descartes says, I think not. And he disappears. <laughs> I think that for I am. I think not so disappeared. Anyway, so <laughs> I am not the mind. I am neither the body nor the mind. I am the consciousness other than the body and mind. The self is awareness, sentience, consciousness. I am using them, these words indiscriminately because no one, none of them precisely mean what the Sanskrit Sanskrit has many words for this in Vedanta. Chit, Chaitanya, Chiti, Samvit, Vidyarthya uses Samvit. So these are different words for awareness or consciousness. That's what we are. Immediately, a lot of problems are solved. Old age, body. Disease, body. Maybe mind. Death, body. Misery, mind. Nothing. I am aware of the miserable mind. Mentally disturbed lover. <laughs> I never found out whether it was the South American animal llama of the Andes or, or the Tibetan monk llama. <laughs> mind. Unhappy? Mind. Unhappiness in the mind. If the if unhappiness in the mind, I am the experience of the unhappy mind, then I cannot be unhappy. The seeing and the seer are different. Are different. So if there, I'm experiencing unhappiness in the mind, the unhappiness is in the mind apart from me. You might say, all oh, this is nice in logic, but <laughs> um, it does not help me practically. It does. It does. First, drive it into your understanding. Once we understand it, once it becomes clear, they say in Uttarakhand, the buddhi sat ke pakshapati, the intellect takes the side of truth, whatever it considers to be the truth. That becomes reality. Why do we consider dreams to be real? In the dream, the dream seems to be real and we react to it as if it is real. Why? Because we consider it to be real. What happens when you wake up? When you wake up, you consider that it was a dream, it's not real. Then it doesn't affect you anymore. What the intellect understands is real, that, is, that affects you. So you understand this. This uh, unhappiness, all of this is apart from you, not you. They come and go. And you are the unaffected awareness. So this is the self, Atma. This is Atma, Anatma, Viveka. Good? We are done? <laughs> no. After having explained all of this, Chankaracharya really pulls a fast one there. In the, in, the, in the 41st verse of, of uh, Aparokshana Bhuti, you find, okay, this is who I am, wonderful. Let me realize this, I'll be free, moksha. Shankaracharya says, so you've got it, yes, I am the unchanging witness, consciousness, self, atma, body is changing, mind is changing, I am the drashta, the shir, all of this. Very wonderful. And you can see it, experience it right now, it's not wrong. Shankaracharya says, what have you gained? Literally, he says, if you do this, 
What has been gained? Nothing. Nothing. This is very interesting that um, <laughs> I, I read a joke about you know, there's something called a snake oil salesman. <laughs> Somebody who tells you, uh, sells you something and giving um, advertisements for it, but it's really just, it's not nothing um, which works. One such person was in the days of the Wild West, was uh, arrested and the judge uh, sentenced him to prison. The charge was selling real cures for imaginary diseases and imaginary cures for real diseases. <laughs> That's unfair because at this point, Sankhya philosophy, actually say what we have been discussing so far is the insight of Sankhya philosophy. It's not yet Advaita. Advaita has not started yet. What you can consider this to be the first step to Advaita. It's not non-duality. Shankaracharya says in the 41st verse of Aparoksha Nabhuti, what have you gained by doing this? This is not sufficient for moksha. Where is Advaita? Advaita means not to, non-dual. But what have you done? I am the consciousness, I am the unchanging awareness. Apart from a changing mind, changing body and outside, this vast universe is there. Full of millions and billions of entities. Where is non-duality? There is duality with the vengeance. Earlier, I thought I was this body and this universe is separate from me. Dvaita. Now I think I am the consciousness and everything else is separate from me. It's still Dvaita. This is still Dvaita. It is not a Dvaita. Many people get confused. A Dvaita has two steps. I gave a talk in Sasha Barber this time. Two steps to not to. <laughs> two steps to not to. This has to be understood. Otherwise many people get confused. You know why? First step is to see yourself as that pure existence consciousness place apart from everything else. But that's not Advaita, but everything else is still there. So you are consciousness, unchanging awareness. When Shankaracharya sings, Mano I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, I am not the ego, I am not the five elements, I am not the senses, all of that. And then he says, Chidananda Rupa Shimo I am of the nature of unchanging consciousness. That is Shiva, of bliss and consciousness. But have you noticed there? My, I'm not the mind, body, intellect, all of those five senses, five elements. That means all those things are still there. And I'm separate from that. Is this Advaita? No. This is the first step. First step to Advaita. What confusion it leads to, you know? Notice, Advaita keeps saying two things. I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, and all of that. I am Brahman. Step one. Next, they will say, Brahman is everything. That means body, mind, universe. Isn't it confusing? Are you all of this or are you not? Philosophically speaking, now the question, the deep question is, I am consciousness and everything is an object of my experience. Question is now, this is the question, what is the relationship between consciousness and its object? I am awareness. What is the relationship between awareness and this object? By that I mean, are they independent, separate realities interacting with each other? Each other? Or is one created by the other? Or is one part of the other? Or is one just appearing in the other? Different positions. Here are four positions. Consciousness and object. Consciousness and matter. Awareness and the universe. What is the relationship? Not a theoretical question. It is something that we are using all the time. Right now, are you not awareness with the body and the mind and listening to words which are coming, looking at things? It's basically consciousness and objects. That's what's happening. That's our life. Consciousness and its objects. That's all our life. What is the relationship between the two? One answer is, consciousness is generated by, the, by matter, by objects. That is the materialist, reductionist position. Matter, energy, time, space, these are real and they evolve into living matter. Living matter evolves into complex brains and nervous systems and from there a byproduct, an epiphenomenon, 
is something called consciousness. Matter is real, consciousness is an evolute, what we call an epiphenomenon, like a flame burning in a candle. That is materialism. If body dies, consciousness is gone. No, many birds, I will go to heaven or hell or whatever. No, nothing like that. Body dies, you are gone. Materialism. That is the idea of mainstream science right now. Body is all, matter is all, consciousness is a micro. One theory. The other theory is just the opposite. Theistic approach in religion. God created the universe. Whether it is Christianity or theistic Hinduism or Islam or Judaism, theistic approach is God created the universe. And any religion, religion you ask, is your God a conscious God or an unconscious God? Say, of course a conscious God. So consciousness creates the universe. That's the theistic approach. I'm giving, I'm painting with broad strokes here. Second approach is the relation between consciousness and object. Objects are created by consciousness. Matter is created by consciousness. Approach of religion, theistic religion. Third approach. Neither creates the other. Consciousness and matter. Consciousness and objects are parallel realities. They are eternally there, interacting with each other, but neither created by the other. This is, can anyone tell me who, which viewpoint? Sankhya viewpoint. And you will be amazed to know, today, today, 21st century, the leading minds in consciousness study, one respectable, though highly debated, point of view, it's called panpsychism. Panpsychism. It was a theory earlier. Right now it is being championed by David Chalmers, who coined the term the hard problem of consciousness. And I was amazed to find him in Manhattan itself. He's there in the, in the president, he's the head of the mind, brain, consciousness unit of NYU. He coined the term the hard problem of consciousness. Basically his point is, consciousness cannot be explained by the brain. There's no way a physical system can be conscious. Uh, that means it can have first person experiences. And there's a whole argument for that. Therefore he says, we may have to, and it's important because he does not come from the um, Eastern religion, you know, Hinduism, Vedanta, Buddhism point of view. But he's saying, I don't know if he knows that, but he's saying exactly what Sankhya said. Kapila, according to uh, Swami Vivekananda, the oldest, the first philosopher in the world, Kapila, he said, consciousness and matter are two parallel realities. In Sanskrit, he called it pra Purusha Prakriti, Prakriti Purusha. Recently, I, I was in a conference uh, with Deepak Chopra, is that the word? That's it. And he, he said, just before the talk, we were, we were talking and he said, um, there is no hard problem of consciousness, right Swamiji? In, in, in Vedanta, the problem is solved. I said, you shouldn't put it that way. <laughs> if you put it that way, you close, you shut the doors. For the first time, serious scientists independently, quite apart, he was annoyed that they don't acknowledge the, the idea was in Sankhya, in Vedanta. He said they did not acknowledge it. They are coming to this point of view independently. And that's really good. We should say, yes, the hard problem of consciousness is a serious problem. It is. It's a serious problem for materialism. Mm -hmm. yeah. I saw this cartoon, a uh, person, uh, scientist, consciousness studies, trying to explain consciousness. So step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. A lot of mathematics. Step one, two, three, full of mathematics on the board. And step five, again, a lot of mathematics. Step four, it is said. In step four, it's just written, miracle. <laughs> and the guide is telling this research student, I think you have to work on step four. <laughs> matter, 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 matter. And then suddenly consciousness. In between, miracle. So David Chalmers says, consciousness is fundamental. That's the position he's holding on to. That is, consciousness is a fundamental reality of the universe. Quite apart from time, space, matter, energy. Just as we regard those as fundamental, perhaps we say, this is perhaps, we have to come to the position where to admit consciousness is a fundamental reality. Sankhi proposition. That's the third philosophy. The fourth philosophy, the fourth, fourth option is the Advaitic option, where not that consciousness is produced by matter, brain does not produce consciousness, not that consciousness produces the universe, God is not creating the universe, 
Not that they are two parallel realities, but the entire universe is an appearance in consciousness. It's not apart from consciousness. It's like Shankaracharya gives the example of a pot and clay. Clay is the reality, and the pot is not a separate reality produced by the clay. Rather, the clay itself appears with a name and form and utility of a pot. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara. Is the pot a second reality apart from the clay? What is the relationship of the pot with the clay? Advaita, non-dual, not two. Pot seems to be something different, but actually it's not two. Why it's not two? You can't show them separately. Take away the clay, show me the pot. No. You cannot. Take away the gold, show me the ornament. You cannot. In Aparoksha Rabhuti, Shankaracharya gives 15 examples to prove this point. Wave and water, clay and pot, gold and ornament, and so on. Snake and rope, the classic example, and so on. But there is one reality which experiences itself as seemingly separate matter, you know, matter, space, time, energy. I like what David Chalmers, in an interview, he said. If you think long enough about the problem of consciousness, then either you become a panpsychist, the consciousness is fundamental, or you go into administration. <laughs> <laughs> you become an administrator, huh? head of department. <coughs> and they are beginning to seriously think of it. They have not adopted that position. No, no. I, I was in, in a, uh, this uh, conference where uh, there was the head of the philosophy department of um, CUNY, City University of New York, Massimo. Uh, and he's a biologist, he's a reductionist, he does not accept that consciousness is fundamental. He says brain produces consciousness. How? Give us time, we will, will explain it. Give us time, we will explain it. I said, what about David Ch uh, Chalmers' point of view? Um, why won't you accept that? He's a colleague in a different university. What's your problem with that? Consciousness is a fundamental reality. And his answer is very interesting. And that's the answer of most scientists today. Why they will not accept it? Then if we accept it, he said, honestly, if we accept it, then we have to change our entire worldview. That I'm not willing to do. And I, there were about 70 other people in the room. They were, most of them were doing it. Exactly, that's what. You have to change your worldview. Every major scientific discovery forced you to change your paradigm. So that's where we are at. Advaita is established when you realize the entirety of the world of experience. That world out there, this body and your mind, thoughts, emotions, ideas, all of them are not apart from you, the consciousness. That very consciousness appears as its own object. Proof? Very easy, actually. Two things are separate. I'll end with this, I've run out of time. Two things are separate if and only if you can show them separately. See, this clock is separate from me. You can see it with me. You can see it apart from me, here. If I'm not there, the clock is there. The clock is not there, I am there. So we are two different realities. Now, let me ask you the question this way. Consciousness and its objects. Can you ever experience the objects without consciousness? Can you ever experience anything without consciousness? No. Nothing in the world can be experienced without consciousness. A physicist, we have the physicist in the Vedanta Society, Bill Conrad, he is 95 years old, and he takes a strong materialist point of view, and he said, Swami, what do you mean? We'll keep a camera recording here, and we'll all go away, no conscious being here. And when you come back, you'll find this hall was existing, because the, the camera has recorded the existence of the hall. Does the hall exist in your consciousness, or exists independently? But I said to him, Camera, recording, and seeing the recording, all of this experiment you have designed is in your consciousness, is it not? <laughs> He's still thinking of an answer. When I go back, he will have an answer ready for him. Object of consciousness is non dual advaita with respect to consciousness. It's all very good. What about me? You are that. You are that non-dual reality of the entire universe. Remember, I'm not saying that the universe appears in you like a dream. Universe appears in you the consciousness. 
not in you, the person. Even the person appears in you, the consciousness. It is not that the person who gets liberated. It's not the person, that that individual being who will get freedom. But you, the consciousness, get freedom from the person. The person will still exist, but as an appearance. It will exist. The body will be born and change and age and decay and die. You are the witness of the birth and change of the body and even the death, eventual death of the body. You do not die. In the, modern, in the Panchadashi, very beautiful line is there. Um, Mahasabda yuga, uh, yuga kalpeshu gata gamnesho nekadha no deti nastave ti e, eka samvid esha svayam brahma. This self luminous consciousness, it's like a sun which neither rises nor sets. Years roll by, eons roll by, <coughs> yugas and kalpas. The sun of consciousness neither rises nor sets, it's one and constant, and that you are. I think I will end here. This is that non-dual reality we are speaking about, and this is the fact right now. Right now. Um, can we take a couple of questions? Sure. Before we confess. OK, there's, there's a hand here. Just raise your hand, we'll come to you. Let's, uh, just sit there. The microphone is coming to you. Uh, first, you have to be a Tahir, and then I will come to you. <laughs> oh, OK. It's <laughs> not Quick question, yes. Please tell us your name and ask the question. Um, Fatma yes. Chatterjee? Yes. Um, quick question. Um, how does karma or your action fit into this? What I mean, and the accountability, when you do some action, you can say it was done by my body and mind. Yes. And not by my consciousness. Yes. So I'm not responsible. Ah. Right? <laughs> so, so but what I am thinking, given your non-dualist answer, whether it is because the, the, the universe and the matter is a reflection of your consciousness, so that action was part of your conscious mind as a reflection of what you did. Correct. Is Very that good the question. Same one? Right. It, it, that's one. And I, I will tell you, this is a beautiful question, and it leads again straight to non-duality. Look at the question. What is the role of action? If I am consciousness, then I am not responsible for action. But Advaita will ask you, which I are you talking about? Is it consciousness limited by body and mind? Then you are responsible. Because action, karma is basically causality. Actions have consequences. So the actions performed by the individual, who is the individual? Consciousness limited by, identified, uh, identified with, become one with one body and one mind. When you do action through that, Without that action is not possible. Then causality is set into motion. Cause will generate a, uh, a result. Karma will generate karma phala. And the result will come back to that person. But consciousness in itself, you say I am consciousness in itself. Then the question of action itself is not there. How is action possible? With the body. Kaena vacha manasa. By body, by language, by mind. That's how we think, we speak, we do. But all of that is not, not consciousness. It is consciousness with body-mind. Vivekananda put it very So consciousness by itself is not affected by karma. In fact, in consciousness in itself, kar uh, karma or causality is denied. Vivekananda put it directly. The answer to your question is in Swami Vivekananda's Song of Sanyasi. He says, good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. That is karma. Whosoever wears a form, wears the chain too. Wears a form means identifies himself or herself, even himself or herself in his body. With, you know, it's very interesting. You say himself, herself. Gender is basically of the body. Maybe to some extent the mind. But consciousness is that in which the body and mind appear. My realistic question is, in Manhattan, in New York, by law, they are now, you will not believe. You know how many genders? <laughs> 31. You will not even know that there are so many genders exist in the world. There are 31 genders by law. Yes. And don't laugh. Because if you, if you don't agree with that, you are a bad person. <laughs> so, anyway, but that's all the, that's the body. That's also the mind. So, uh, what does Advaita say? Vivekananda says there. 
that uh, whosoever wears a form wears the chain too. And then what is the position of Advaita? But far beyond name and form is Atman ever free. In our term, consciousness ever free. Know thou art that. Know that you are that consciousness. So you are ever free, even now, while experiencing body and mind, while experiencing the person called Partha. Even the person called Partha disappears in deep sleep every day in the network, right? From your experience, blankness. So that one is ever free from causality. Yeah, reminds me of the third Newton's law. You need an external action to external force to split the inertia, right? So in this case, consciousness is that external. Action. The knowledge of consciousness. Oh, knowledge. The knowledge that I am consciousness. It helps you to escape from the bonds. One more. There was a hand here. We'll end with that question. We've run out of time actually. Well, there was a hand somewhere here. Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is Sivan Mohanty. I have a question. You talked about who they might. Can you summarize, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, good. That was the easy one. <laughs> this is what we what we talked about today. But don't worry. Uh, don't worry. We will again talk about it tomorrow. Tomorrow's subject, the essence of all Vedanta, is again an answer to that question, who am I? <laughs> it's, it's, it was exactly our, our, our subject today, who am I? It's, it's this, this awareness, this consciousness, uh, which is asking this question. That is who we really are. And we will talk about it tomorrow. It's a good way to end the, today's talk. Tomorrow's talk is on the essence of all Vedanta. The same topic, but now approaching it from the point of view of the Mandukya Upanishad, the most powerful of the Upanishads. Let me do a twelve of each chant and end, please. Om Shanti 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 Hare Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Paramahamsu. So our thanks uh, to Swami Sarvapriya for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I won't hold you with more time now because uh, he will be back tomorrow night. Of course, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> in fact, as consciousness, he is as he is with, uh, can't go anywhere. Uh, but uh, he will be here tomorrow night in form, and he will be here again on Thursday night. Uh, Thursday night will be what we call Satsang, which most of you know, uh, where he will uh, be informal, question and answers, etc. So please, uh, all of you who can, you're uh, most uh, welcome and encouraged to come tomorrow night, same time, same location, and uh, Thursday.